This is Medieval Courts and Trial Law. I'm going to pass this on. My name is B.A. Simmons. I'm a writer primarily. I do teach uh, school uh, up in North Ogden at junior high school. H I um, English and history are, are my uh, specialties there. Um, but more importantly, I think for this particular panel, I've spent the majority of my life doing historical medieval reenactment, uh, focusing on Western Europe. Um, if you heard those of you in the front row with me, have heard me uh, speaking about one already. Um, and that's where most of my, my knowledge and understanding of this comes. But also, I take the perspective of using that information in what I write as I write a medieval sci-fi um, series of novels. My name is Dan Jeffrey. Um, I so I this is this was an interesting topic for me to research. I have a background in anthropology, archaeometallurgy, um, history. I've had a strong interest in medieval studies. I've taken some coursework around this particular topic, but it's not something that I've researched super heavily or published in prior to getting on this panel and doing a little more research. So I'm, uh, I'm excited about it, I, and it'll be a fun conversation. Uh, my name is Michael Goudreau. I have an undergrad in biblical studies with a focus on the Roman period. Uh, and then I'm finishing my master's in medieval history with an emphasis on the Carolingians and Old Saxon. Uh, this matters because most of the medieval period is incredibly Christianized. Uh, and they are pulling off both Old Testament law and Roman law predominantly, um, which I'm sure we'll talk both about quite a bit. Uh, and particularly the Saxon codes, which I think I focused more on, uh, both under the Carolingians and then in Anglo-Saxon England, and they're pretty fun. So, so to be clear, this conversation will probably be centered on the far right of the table. Uh, so. Something I saw earlier that I actually really like, um, with the understanding that I treat seed questions as more suggestions. Uh, does somebody want to volunteer, like raise your hand and let me know what you want to see out of this panel? What, is there something specific where you're like, I have this burning desire to know how they treated splitting chicken harvest in the Middle Ages or something like that? Anyone? So I'm starting a middle grade epic fantasy more or less. Dragons, princess, magic, she's in hiding, her uncle's the regent, he's evil, naturally. Um, so I just want an understanding of how courts and laws and all that kind of stuff in general worked. That's a good place to start. Uh, he was next and then you... Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, a basic overview of how it existed first. What were the various moving parts to it and how did they you know, reflect back to the court or to the church or whatever. Okay, you, you, you. What do um, modern books and movies get wrong about this book? <laughs> 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 yeah. You ready for a three week time? Um, writing from the perspective of someone who uh, expects to be breaking a lot of laws, you know, a medieval villain, what are they going to be thinking of? What are they going to be trying to avoid? What are their concerns about the law going to be? How is that different from a modern criminal? Yeah. Okay. All right. um, I'm, I'm most interested in uh, the political marriage aspect of it, uh, uh, specifically you know, the, the couple being the, you know, physical representation of the union, what happens if they don't have any kids? Right. Okay. Uh, I think we've got time for two more. So you and then... Just at the end, if you could give us some references of where to go do some more research. Then, how did they actually investigate crimes? And that's represent the other thing. That's right. That's the question. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start this out uh, with, so I, I'm going to flaunt my, my tiny, tiny amount of knowledge about this um, and give a, a kind of going forward look, uh, and I figure it's my job to spark the conversation. Uh, to my understanding, modern law worldwide comes down to two basic systems. You have French and British common law. And both of those have their roots in the Middle Ages, and both of them actually have roots in the Roman common law. And the, the thing is that uh, modern common law has spread even from Europe to Asia because of colonization and because they said, oh, hey, this is a convenient set of rules. Let's just adopt that. 
Um, do any of you have any commentary on the difference between British and French common law and, and history thereof? Yeah, so... Uh, so take three steps back. Um, the foundation of medieval law is, a fun, is essentially um, Roman law codified by Justinian in the 5th century in an actual codification of law, a digest provided to judges, um, and then another one basically for what we might call lawyers, another piece for lawyers. Um, alongside that, you have this strong emphasis on um, pulling from the Old Testament law, because these are, these are fundamentally, inherently, inescapably religious people who view justice as a matter of God's will in the world. But the third piece that comes in is Germanic, what we might call customary law, where you have this is where dueling and feuds come in. This is where where guild that is the payment for, like I if I main Dax in combat over here, and I you know he loses his 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 good strong finger here. That's a higher charge than say his pinky finger. Um, so as you as you get into the early modern period, you get codification of law developing in the Volker languages. So we see English common law becoming British common law as that that nation sort of develops and spreads, and that's largely based not on in our case, like a constitution, but a set of case law, right? So this judge in Sussex in 1305 said, if you steal his chickens, you have to pay him this amount, this, this fine. And they sort of based their laws on that case history. Um, the, the French law, however, was more, that came out of the Napoleonic Code. This is more a, we're gonna use reason and ration, rationality to, from scratch, kind of, but not really, recreate a whole system of laws um, that sort of fit this enlightenment mentality. Uh, and so it's not based on existing case law, it's based on sort of rational principles put down from uh, the government itself after the French Revolution. And so we only see that in America in uh, Louisiana, which still uses a lot of Napoleonic codes, relatively speaking, compared to the rest of the country. Anyone else? I'll add to the, the idea. Um, that you remember that with this religious aspect, kings and queens were representations of God. They were chosen to, to lead their people. Well, however much that was believed, that was the, the, the case of their claim to the throne, is that God has chosen them to be the leaders for that kingdom, that principality, that uh, government in any of the monarchies there. And so, um, with the woman back here who was writing uh, her middle grade story, in making the uncle just a regent and not a specific, you know, chosen uh, royal, like he's not the king itself, it gives uh, a little leeway of play that you can have there where there's that opportunity for usurpation. Right? He's only regent, right? It's not a, a full on. Uh, rebellion against the, the ruling monarch, who would rep again represents God in that sense. You, keep in mind there's, there's just the three estates through most of the medieval period. So you have the royalty, you have the clergy, who also represent God in a different way, and then everybody else who would be then serfs and vassals. Did I see a question? No? Okay. Can I, can I actually follow up on that? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about kings and queens, we tend to have this notion of um, medieval rulers oftentimes as more enlightenment absolutist, absolutist monarchs. That is, they have absolute power, and if they just want to come and kill you, they can just come and kill you. If they want to come and take your land, your property, they can just do this. Uh, at least in the English tradition, we have, um, they have a strong system of what we called writs, and these things limited to the common law. Um, even the powers of the king. They did have strong notions of what we call natural law, that is laws, sort of foundational universal principles that God has laid down in the world. And even if the king, however powerful, however ordained he might be, broke those things, it was a transgression against both the people, his subjects, and God, him, God himself. And that opened the door for things like the rebellion that led to the Magna Carta, the Great Charter of Rights in England. Um, it also opened the door to Things where um, what are now we call Dutch people uh, would come and like their city ruler was not behaving and they would kill him and eat him. Um, which is not really appropriate for most people, but it happened. Um, so it's important to recognize that these aren't universalist, absolutist principles where 
a king can abuse law without any indiscretion, without any um, consequence. They are bound by certain traditions, they're bound by certain vassal relationships, and if you didn't practically keep your people um, mostly unabused, not entirely unabused, uh, the likelihood of your, your reign being peaceful or long uh, in an already violent world was pretty, had the option to be cut short pretty substantially. And it, just to comment on that as well, is if we talk about the the ruling classes, and as we talk about medieval periods and uh, pre-medieval and dark age periods, um, we're also dealing with, we don't have the kind of centralization of power that we think of when we think king or queen. We think, okay, so there was the boss, and then there were the people under the boss, and then the people under that. You, there, there's much more of a, use the term vassals that they have to take care of. The, the role of being the biggest leader, the king. Um, you know, we have, we have many times in records where there are multiple kings recorded that are simultaneous. And as we go back and, and forward, we well, who we record and who we have reported to us today as the real king depends an awful lot on what happened over the following years and who, who got to finish writing those history books. But it's not as clear cut as there's the president and those people that follow that person. Um, there's a lot more give and take and loyalty that has to be earned and control of assets that consolidates power. One of my favorite examples of this in history is, is just prior to the Norman conquest of England in 1066, you actually had the, the people in northern England who were really upset with the, the Earl of their lands, who was, um, his name was Tostig, and, and uh, he was a brother to the guy who was really the power behind the throne, Harold Godwinson, who later becomes king. But they, they were so upset with the, his leadership that they went so far as you know, a, a full-on like, rebellion and chose two other guys to, to be their leaders instead. And this, of course, gets passed down to Edward uh, Confessor, as he was called the, the king at the time. And they have to make a, a decision. You know, the, you know, and this is then going to Earl Harold, who is really, again, the guy running the country. Edward was kind of a, I would say a pansy king, but uh, there, were, there were issues all around there. And so Harold has to make a ruling against his own brother to decide, are the people really you know, in, in the right here? And, and has his brother been abusing this power? And therefore he needs to go. Or does he side with his brother and say, nah, yeah, you guys are you know, peasant scum, you, know, you do what he says. So it's one of the great examples, that, and it plays a huge role in what happens afterwards with uh, all of that. Okay, so understanding that you had nobility and you had non-nobility, um, as I understand it, there are three types of conflict uh, and this is an oversimplification. You have noble versus noble, you have noble versus non-noble, and you have non-noble versus non-noble. Um, which of these had the most obscure set of rules, which makes for good writing and good plot? <laughs> I really don't want to be that guy, but we're going to be that guy. Well, um, you, you are an expert, you are qualified, yes, revel in your glory. This is true. Um, well, so the, I wouldn't say any of them had no particularly obscure rules. Um, one of the things, we, we often think of it as a dark age, we often think of the medieval period as um, sort of less civilized somehow. Um, but they were really big on codification, they were really big on having very um, set standards of law. Um, and so I don't know that any of them would necessarily be obscure. They do offer interesting comparisons though. So, if, let's say, uh, this gentleman in the hat here is a noble, um, and you killed him. Well, you would owe a lot more money for it, so they, they didn't have a strong prison system like we think about. In fact, maybe they're a little more civilized because they're not locking people in cages for their whole lives. Um, but if you kill him, you would now owe his family money, or a blood feud ensues. And so you would charge like $8,000 for him because he's a noble, and then if you took Dax over here, who's clearly a peasant, like four, you know. <laughs> And then if uh, Dax has a buddy who's a serf, he's only worth like two. 
Uh, and then if you if you took a, a person, regardless of social status, who's a friend of the king, so let's say he's the king and he's his best friend, you kill him, he's worth a lot of money. Uh, because now you've hurt a confidant of the king and you've hurt the kingdom itself. Um, and so they, they, they have had a class structure in their law where your value in man price, essentially, to buy off vengeance, uh, went up the better you were in society. <coughs> Um, but also the more vulnerable. So children, if you if you killed someone's kids, your price went way up. Uh, and if you damaged someone in a way that prevented them from having children, that was really costly. Uh, if you crippled someone, that cost a lot of money. Uh, like really obsessive fines that most normal people wouldn't be able to probably pay and would end up in some sort of like servitude. Um, but that that creates compelling con that can create compelling conflict because maybe you're writing a story and your character's lower class. And they very rightly defend someone against a noble, and they cripple that noble somehow, and suddenly they owe a wealth of money to not, not the king, not the state treasury like in our society, but to that family who's obviously much more powerful, much more wealthy than them. Uh, and then that, that just dynamic itself would create conflict. With the beer. Um, yeah, uh, a question then. Were there any instances, if this is how it's working, were there instances of people that would use that as kind of the way to build a reputation? Like, oh, I have so much money that I've never paid or something? There's definitely abuses, absolutely. Um, you'd also, if you hurt someone, you also have the opportunity to flee to a sanctuary. Um, so in Old Testament law, you have this establishment of sanctuary cities, generally run by the Levites, where if, you know, I accidentally killed Dax. It wasn't on purpose, guys. I have nothing against Dax. He's a very nice man. Yes, it just so happened. Nothing against him. I was swinging that axe handle, and the head just came off and cratered him. Um, it happens. It happens all the time. Then you could flee to a church sanctuary or another place of peace, and there you would be safe from retribution, and there you would seek through your family, through your kinship, through your friends, a way to make peace, whether that's buying them off using word guild or acts of peacemaking. Um, vengeance was always sort of paired with peacemaking in this time period. Um, and it was really important because these are small communities, they're tight-knit communities, and if you have people who are doing this, who are abusing people for the wear guild, because um, they know they can pay it, you would have um, families that refuse to pay. And we'll, we'll just take our vengeance in your flesh, and we'll pay the guild. So the conversation we've been having is about the consequences, right? Right. And, but part of the discussion is about, uh, and one of the questions that was asked is about how do we determine guilt, right? Right. And that's an interesting mess in and of itself, you know? And like the, even the example you just gave of, you know, how do we decide whether or not it's true that right. Dax accidentally got cratered in the head by your ax? Well, I mean, look at it. Yeah, yeah, but you know, maybe maybe you guys have been drinking, and, you know. But when we get to when we get to determining guilt, some of the, the concepts that are really different than how we do things today, um, you know, they, we we we've talked about the idea of nobility, and we've talked about the idea, but when we're when we're establishing guilt, um, the trustworthiness of the individuals matters a lot Absolutely. in terms of whether they're going to say. You know, this person's word, do we consider this a trustworthy person or an untrustworthy person? And the way that the law gets applied in terms of how they can uh, be exonerated is very different. And that's where we get into things like ordeals. Ordeals yes. are primarily going to be applied to untrustworthy people um, or for extreme circumstances. So what do you trust what ordeals are? Okay. It's actually, well... We, we can just keep going. I had a transition for... That. Actually, I think uh, you had something you were going to say on that. No, it's not. Okay, go for it. All right, so, we'll keep going. Okay. So, um, so we talked about ordeals and trials by ordeal, and you know, within that, we've already mentioned the uh, duels or trials by combat. Um, other trials by ordeal that uh, were common were, let's see, we had the fire, there's water, and hot and cold water were different. Um, and you got a list here for me? Oh, here we go. There's the trial by the cross, yep. And then we have ingestion, yes. And ingestion is really interesting because, of, and oh, this is the last one. Ingestion and oath are both interesting too, though, because they're kind of an inversion, right? Where the trial by ingestion and the trial by oath are essentially things where you're innocent unless something goes badly. And the rest of them are 
you're probably you may die from it, um, and you're in, almost definitely you're going to be injured by it, um, and you're probably guilty unless it goes weird. So I think it's important to remember in any of these trial, I'm sorry, any of the trial by ordeal, the the basic concept here is that God is going to protect the innocent. Right? If you're guilty, God's going to make it so that that guilt becomes known through the ordeal. And if you're innocent, you get off, there's no problem. Like, in fact, the trial by fire, the idea was either to walk over something hot like coals, or they would actually heat up plowshares in, the, in many cases, right? And you have to walk on these heated plowshares, right? They've been, you know, you know staked it with, uh, with uh, fire and coals. And you can't have anything, you know, your feet can't be burned at the end of it. You, you walk over that and your feet are fine, hey, you're innocent. God protected your feet. Yeah. Actually, I mean, in a lot of the cases, in a lot of cases, wasn't it not that you're fine, but that they would bind the injury? It was expected that you'd be injured, and then three days later, a priest would assess whether it was healing or healed, or if it was festering. And if it was, if it if it looked like it was getting worse, then that was a condemnation. Which is great in a society that doesn't understand germ theory, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Germs decide whether you live or die. Right. <laughs> yeah. Whether or not they want to do Right. And even in the trial by ingestion, um, and this was one I, I was not clear on myself. Maybe uh, someone else has more in, information. Um, early on, it was the idea they give you some really dry bread and cheese, and you had to eat it. You know, basically, and if you choked, you're guilty. But I, I'm wondering, in, in that sense myself, is, is this like choking like you need the high liquid or you're gonna die? Or choking as in you just gag once and that was a sign of your guilt? Yes, yeah, so it's a great question, we may not have the answer to it. And so, or even by the Eucharist. Um, if it's anything like medieval recipes, so I, well no, seriously, medieval recipes were a pinch of this, well, what's a pinch? And and it, you, you heat it until it is warm enough that it scalds your wrist, okay? So a choke is probably determined by whoever's administering the test, <laughs> in, in all seriousness. Uh, it depends. Some of the some of the cases it was explicitly specified, right? Like I mean, especially as we get later, there's a, one of the things that I looked at designated ten penny weight of cheese and ten penny weight of bread. So it's explicitly specified how much it is they're given. I think if you look at who the cases where they choose to use the different ordeals, so the trial by ingestion <laughs> is used in cases where they're presuming innocence. Right? The expectation is that most people administered this are going to be fine. And if they die, then, oh well. And the trial by oath is similar, right? You promised you didn't do it, and if you die within the next year, then you were guilty. <laughs> yeah. So the trial by ingestion is, so is similarly. It, yeah, the trial by ingestion uh, when applied with the Eucharist, or as it would be commonly called now, the sacrament. Right. Uh, you you are under uh, you're under oath that you are pledging your innocence before God. You take the Eucharist, and then yes, you're given about a year. And if you die, then you were guilty, and and God kills you because you partook partook of that unworthily because of your guilt. And and I, I think I think one of the things with specifically with communion, right? If it was actually the Eucharist that they were taking, they were they also. Um, and I don't have a good source for this, actually. This was the impression I got. But that it was your, your very religious society, right? Yes. And so if you consume this on a lie, if you consume this dishonestly, then you are, you know, they're watching the person to see their reaction because they know yeah. that if they take this dishonestly, they're damned. They, they, made, they put themselves in a situation where they will go to hell for taking this as a part of his lie and his oath. Therefore, watching the person, seeing if they're unwilling to take it, seeing if they're stressed about, I don't, I don't want to do this, um, is part of the test. So, uh, was trial by combat an actual thing, and when was it applied? So, trial by combat is a real thing. It, it's very old in... Uh, Germanic literature. Um, so Germans love this. It actually becomes codified. Um, in se several instances, uh, you have 
Otto the Great, who is a Saxon German emperor, um, puts out, um, it's like the Saxon spiel, sort of gives you rules for it. Um, yeah, they believed it, they, but it wasn't a, it wasn't just like, okay, so we're gonna fight now. There were, there were champions. This is actually pretty accurate, there are champions. And a lot of times, if you knew, I guess say we have a few, and we've both chosen champions and they're fighting, and maybe you can clearly pay for the better champion, and it's going very badly for me immediately, we're not gonna let this, I'm gonna let this stand. I'm gonna go, hey, let's make a deal. Let's figure this out. How can I help you not hurt me? Uh, and so it wasn't always something that went to the death. Oftentimes it was injury because you're not actually fighting for yourself. Um, but again, it was predicated on this notion that God will vindicate the just by martial victory. Um, and we hear that, I think sometimes because we're modern people, we think well, that's clearly silly. Um, and no one probably believed that. But in reading the documents at the time and looking at their societies, this is, a, this is a real thing that I think a lot of them actually did believe. And we should take it seriously when they say that. And so they see this as a justifiable method um, that as the time period goes on, does wane. Um, but we have dueling up until the Civil War in America. Like this is a very old tradition, and it actually happened throughout um, the German period, up through the High Middle Ages, and even into the early modern period. I think it is important to recognize that it is a Germanic tradition, yeah. right? It came over to England, but it wasn't something that was, that was spread across the rest of Europe, really. It was a Germanic tradition that followed the Germanic peoples, and that's where it was founded, and that's where it happened. Trial by combat didn't occur um, in, really in the rest of Europe. And one of the ways that it was used sometimes was trial by combat was something that was encouraged in, in order to uh, stave off duels or having people instead incorporating it into the legal system yeah. so that it's not just people going out and stabbing each other. Now yeah. you're stabbing each other in a way that there's some legitimacy and control-ish. Yeah, all parties have to agree. There's set standards and procedures. Um, first of all, um, if you're interested, there, there is a uh, there is a, a literary uh, example for trial by combat in the book Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott. Again, uh, keep in mind, even Sir Walter Scott wasn't trying to make a historically accurate uh, novel when he wrote this in the late 1700s, early 1800s. You know, but at the same time, it, as far as fictionalizing it and putting it in, it, it is a good example of the idea. And uh, I especially like, and I'll spoil it for you guys, um, you know, the bad guy loses the trial by combat. But for a specific, there's, a, there's an interesting reason in that, uh, if, you, if you read that book, is to find out why exactly he ends up losing. Um, so anyway, it's a great book. Uh, also, all of these ordeals, at one point or another, were, were then kind of renounced um, by royalty, by leadership. Sometimes even the Pope would, would come out and say, okay, this is ridiculous, let's stop doing this. That didn't keep people from doing it, though. They, they still followed these ordeals because they wholeheartedly believed in some way or another that they were valid, even after some of the leadership came out and said, no, no. So we, we talked a little bit about ordeals. Uh, we we'll talked a bunch about ordeals. Um, but we also, should we talk about uh, wagers? About the... About the pro so there was the idea, especially among your uh, less trusted, your untrusted uh, defendants, that they could have. So for a long, this act, this continued actually for a long time. Um, that you could have what they call a wager of law or uh, purgators was another term that I found in the literature where they would they would go and find people who would be willing to take an oath as to really their character witnesses. That's the way we look at it nowadays. And you go and get people and they and so and in some periods they could be they could be family even. Um, in other periods, it had to be people who knew you from your town or whatever. And they'd take an oath that, no, that person wouldn't do that. And then if you got 12 of them, say, they, there'd be an assigned number depending on the crime and decision that was being made. Um, and if they would come and testify that you wouldn't do that, then you were not guilty. Which, obviously, we don't... 
This is the predecessor of our 12-man jury system that we still operate today. And the same idea though, if there were, my understanding was that there was uh, evidence that came out after the, these um, people testified on your behalf that kind of proved that you were guilty of it, that they themselves would then be put on trial for having borne a false witness. Right? They, so there was a, there's, where the wager idea came is there's a gamble to it, right? How well do you know this person that you're going to then testify for? Are, are you willing to stake your own reputation, your own life, in, in essence, on whether or not you really think they didn't do it, right? There's a question over here. Well, I just wanted to thought, if you could fabricate evidence, couldn't you abuse the crap out of that to like wipe out a whole bunch of people at once? Well, and so a big part of why the system worked the way it did and why they did it the way they did is because it was relying on the close relationships both between family and between the community. Uh, you knew everyone around you and, and you know the people that were untrustworthy were Everybody thought they were untrustworthy for a reason, and you don't want to give your oath to support somebody if you don't think that that's true, because then you slide down that scale of trustworthiness and what people think they can and can't expect from you. And within a small community of people who have known each other for generations, that carries severe consequences for you and your children. Yeah. And to kind of go off that, um, uh, someone had asked simply for an overview of kind of how medieval court works. Um, so that's going to vary wildly by region, but what is more universal is the fact that these are largely local affairs. So you have city courts, you have regional kind of county courts, you do have a royal court, you do have um, groups of, of jurors that kind of meet with the king and talk about certain things, but by and large, most justice, you have clerical courts, are handled at that local rural community level. So it is, yeah, you might say, well, maybe I could kind of fudge this system. Um, but you're dealing with people who've probably known you your whole life, but you're not really traveling very far. Um, you're dealing with people who have an understanding of the system from birth, like we're born into it, this is how we do things. Um, if I'm, I'm living in a city, there'll be a, a local kind of municipal court that you'd go to that would hash out problems that would be from selected men in the city. Um, it wasn't... It wasn't sort of like there's a Supreme Court that you go to. I want to interject something. Yeah. Understand, when he's talking about not traveling very far, even in the 1800s in Britain, there were people who had never gone so far that they could not see the smoke from their own chimney in their entire lives. That was the 1800s. They had trains and an actual road system. That, I, that is. Uh, this still happens today. I mean, uh, I, spent, yeah. I spent part of my life in, in uh, southeastern Idaho. There were people who lived their entire lives just there. They didn't really It's like a hundred square there. miles yeah. total. Yeah, exactly. And that's only because they went to the county fair. <laughs> that doesn't seem to get out of comfort. Don't get all your comforts. Yes, Gary. What would be the most common or the easiest place to corrupt? So if I'm writing a corruption to the law system, yeah, yeah, yeah. where would I target? I would argue probably either cities um, or, unfortunately, um, churches. Yes. So uh, it is very, there are a lot of devout people in this period, um, but people are shady and corrupt and evil sometimes. And it is very possible that a wealthy person buys himself um, a power, a position of power, which is very, very possible in this period, uh, because of his noble birth, because of his wealth, uh, and then uses that, abuses that position. Um, we see this, uh, so we think of celebrities today as like movie stars and whatnot. In the Middle Ages, scholars, oftentimes theologians were rock stars, and we see this where there's a, there's a famous case of um, a man named Abelard, uh, who is a theologian, he's brilliant, he's young, uh, he's, he's kind of a ladies man, um, and he gets hired to tutor this woman, Heloise, who's this really exceptionally brilliant woman who's writing and is kind of famous in Paris and the surrounding regions. Uh, and he uses his tutoring uh, as an excuse to basically have an affair with her. And um, vengeance is really big in this period, and they get they forced to get married by her uncle, who's a cleric, and then they kind of separate because it's bad for his reputation. Like this wasn't really good for him. And the uncle thinks that he has put her away, like he's divorcing her or sending her to a monastery or nunnery. And so they bribe his uh, servant basically to let him in at night and they castrate him. Um, they take this very seriously. 
These are not people playing around. They're not lighthearted, like, oh, you know, so you suffer them, whatever. No, I'm like, well, this is bad now. Um, and so cities, because you have, a, you have the, the, the guild, you have the wealth, uh, and the church is where you have wealth. And so centers of wealth tend to be centers of corruption. As you talk about the church as well, one of the things to bear in mind, uh, when you think of uh, nunneries and monasteries, um, many of the people populating these are second, third, fourth children of well-off families. Because once they've been sent to the nunnery or the monastery, they cannot come back where it's really unusual or difficult for them to come back and take control of the family or play a political role. Because by having gone into the church, they have to use the church. And so you see political machinations from within the clergy who still are part of it. They still think like the family they were raised in or similar. And you have many people within the clergy there, the people who went into the clergy because they're devout and because it's religious. And then there's also people who, while being a part of the religion, did not primarily go there because they wanted to. They were sent there and therefore they are part of, they, they begin to operate in this organization um, and figure out the way to live a life that they are happy with and want to lead, um, in spite of having been sent away from their family and separated from the wealth and privilege that they've been raised with. One good example of corruption, um, there's a monastery in Eastern England called uh, Bury St. Edmund. Uh, Vikings came in, killed the king, murdered him, um, and that's where he's buried. And we have records, as the Middle Ages go on, uh, monastic centers sort of become these economic powerhouses. Um, they have industry, they have trade, um, they have a lot of wealth, and they have a lot of um, prestige. And we have records from one of the abbots where there is a religious minority community just north of the, uh, the monastery and all the towns, and the guy who's supposed to be buying food and supplies for the monastery and selling their excess goods because they make wine and different things, um, he's been gambling. He's a degenerate gambler, and he's been taking that money for supplies and some of it he spends on the things they need, and as cheaply as possible, and then he's been gambling the rest of it. And then he gets in debt, and he can't pay for the goods anymore, so they start taking out debt from um, these money lenders north of town and selling off um, quietly like the relics and goods of the monastery. And the, the abbot finds out, and they have to bring him to justice, essentially, uh, and then they, they make some accommodations so that only one guy doesn't control this anymore. Um, it's kind of banal, but it's the nature of the world. So just in general, fast, um, keep in mind uh, with the, the clergy, you have the idea of, of holy relics and shrines, and they were in, in real competition with each other to try and, and make the best shrine, the best relics, you have, have these things that people would come on pilgrimage to their site and pay money to be able to worship at these uh, these shrines, and, and that was it. And then later on, of course, the, uh, if you've heard of this, the sale of indulgences, right? The idea of you, know, you pay the church a certain amount of, of money, you can receive forgiveness of various sins, things like that. Um, there were a couple of hands. Yeah. I'll leave. I How much saw her first, and then you? Sorry. Oh, you're good. How much interaction was literally had between like a, the royal class and like the lower classes? So to give you an example from Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, um, so Constantinople, greatest city in the world for a thousand years, one of the emperors decided to go out amongst the people, kind of dressed normally. Uh, no one recognized him, and when he tried to get back in the palace, uh, the guards did not believe he was the emperor and almost beat him to death. They thought he was like a beggar trying to sneak in. Uh, so you have those examples. You do have... Um, other examples are Charlemagne, basically his court's constantly traveling. Um, he's basically moving from one hot spot to another um, during the like 30 or 40 years he reigns. And so he, he holds these sort of county estates throughout his region, and you would come and petition justice. So you did have some interaction in some places, uh, but frankly, Dax is unwashed, and I don't want him around me if I'm royalty, right? Like, I just don't. All these things we're finding out about this. So, kind of going back to her question about the thieves, yeah. right? That was her. Yeah. So, would like the church be a good way to get 
through to break laws or just I really is it like making a character who is either you know a member of the clergy and they're using that as the their way to or they, the they intend to do something that involves breaking laws would they mm-hmm. join the clergy to do that better yes especially if, it, if they're male um Sorry, women. You had a much, much rougher time in the Middle Ages than, than today. Uh, women had a, a much harder time doing in, you know, anything back then. But uh, yeah, men could get away with a lot. I mean, just you know, the idea of, of infidelity. If any member of a, a royal family, um, if they found out that the guy was having affairs, you know, and he even maybe fathered illegitimate children, that was often overlooked. I mean, like John, King John, had about sixteen, so something like that. 20 something, I can't remember the exact number, but lots of illegitimate children. But if a queen or, or a countess or someone uh, female was found to be having these affairs, that those penalties were much higher and more dangerous for her. So, two things. We've got time for one more question for me. I, I don't think we've got any more audience time, question time. You actually asked a question at the beginning that I wanted to answer. Um, before we get to any of that, I want to apologize to the YouTube audience and say there were no Daxes hurt in the making of this panel. Um, so you asked a specific question about uh, what happens if they do not produce heirs. A political a political marriage does not produce heirs. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, that couple represents that union, yeah. and if. Doesn't the heirs, then does the union dissolve? Yep. Um, I'm gonna go with divorce, beheaded, died, divorce, beheaded, survived. Uh, Henry the Eighth. Uh, divorce, beheaded, died, divorce, beheaded, survived. Uh, Henry the Eighth's answer to this is get a new wife. Um, so if you if if you have a spouse who is not producing for you, you could divorce them. You could lop their head off. Those are options. Um, traditionally, though. We have a, there's, there's this idea of um, Salic law, which is Frankish law, and they had notions of sort of how family titles pass. So you might not have a son, but you're bro- you have a brother, and he might get the title, or his son might get the title, um, or a different nephew might get the title. Uh, in certain places, women could inherit. The only place where it was really common, actually, was, more, was uh, northern Spain, uh, Basque County. They had much more um, modern, progressive, kind of equal notions of, of female uh, rulership than most of Western Europe. Um, but usually, you would remain with your spouse um, without murdering them or putting them away um, until they died. Uh, and if you didn't produce an heir, then one of your other family would get it. Or if none of you produced an heir, and, and you, maybe it was just you and all the rest of your family died, and you and your wife never a kid, um, then often the king or whoever was next in the social chain would give that land back because you were only holding it in fief for them. Um, and then they could give it out to whoever they liked. I'm, I'm specifically asking about like joining two kingdoms. Yeah. So in, in those cases, in the same way, you you'd have wars generally over that. So <laughs> the Hundred Years' War literally starts over this issue. Yes. Um, so you have you have notions of kingdoms as personal property essentially in this period. So uh, if you don't produce an heir, then hopefully some of your other family members do. Um, but even then, if you don't have a strong, clear contender for the throne, we fight over it. Like we're Irish or something. Um, <laughs> have you heard that, Jim? Apologize to any Irish. So quick, parting comments. Soon as it comes, it's really yeah. good. Really yeah, good. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, parting comments. Last yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So, thanks, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah. okay. Thank you, everybody.